During the 19th century, Germany alongside the other European powers, Japan and the United States, had scrambled for colonial possessions in Asia. As we had seen in the Boxer Rebellion, there was literally a carving up of China by the end of the 19th century. In 1898, Germany leased a concession over Zhizhou Bay and Chufu in Shandong province for 99 years and built up the city and port of Tsingtao, which became the base of the German East Asiatic Squadron of the Kaiserliche Marine. Alongside this, Germany would lay claim to New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, the Marshall Islands, the Carolyn Islands, the Marianas, and Samoa. Britain was always suspicious and wary of Germany's holdings in Asia and had forged close ties with Japan such as the Anglo-Japanese Alliance of 1902. This alliance continued when World War I began in Europe in August of 1914. On August the 7th, Britain asked Japan for assistance in destroying the Imperial Germans' Navy's raiders in and around Chinese waters. This prompted Japan to send Germany an ultimatum on August the 15th, demanding Germany withdraw her warships from Chinese and Japanese waters and transfer control of Tsingtao to Japan. Hey everyone, I just wanted to let you know I now have a Patreon account found at www.patreon.com slash the Pacific War channel. Over there you can find exclusive Patreon episodes and podcasts based on suggestions from patrons, and other benefits like early access to all of my content, live hangouts, your name in the end credits, and much, much more. So please go check it out. Germany had until August the 23rd to reply as the Japanese prepared to take Tsingtao by force if necessary. Germany never replied, and thus Japan declared war on Germany on August 23, 1914, and subsequently on the Austro-Hungarian Empire on August 25, because their cruiser, SMS Kaiserin Elizabeth, remained at Tsingtao. At the offset of hostilities, the East Asia Squadron under Vice Admiral Maximilian von Spee dispersed to various Pacific colonies. Then they rendezvoused in the northern Mariana Islands for coaling before they would try to escape the Pacific Ocean. SMS Emden headed for the Indian Ocean, while the rest of the squadron made their way to the west coast of South America. On August the 27th, the Imperial Japanese Navy sent warships under the command of Vice Admiral Sajikichi Kato with his flagship Dreadnought Suo to blockade the coast of Kaushao. His fleet consisted of Dreadnoughts Suo, Kawichi, Setsu, battlecruiser Kongo, and Hie, and the seaplane carrier Wakamiya. He was backed up by the Royal Navy's dreadnought HMS Triumph and destroyer HMS Usk. Major General Mitsomi Kamio led the 18th Infantry Division, numbering 23,000 soldiers with 142 artillery pieces, to land at Yunkao on September the 2nd and Laoshan Bay on September the 18th. China remained neutral at this time and protested Japan's violation of their territory but did not interfere. Britain and other European powers were concerned about Japan's intentions in Asia and sent a symbolic force from Tsinsin of 1,500 men, commanded by Brigadier General Nathan Walter Berendinsen. Germany responded to the threat by concentrating all their available East Asian forces into Tsingtao. Their force was commanded by naval captain and governor Alfred Mayer Waldeck and consisted of the Marines of the 3rd Sea Battalion, Chinese colonial troops. Austro-Hungarian sailors for a total strength of 3,625 men with an additional 100 local Chinese police. Their warships included torpedo boat S-90, cruiser Kumaran, Kumaran II, gunboats Yiltis, Jaguar, Tiger and Luchis, and the Austro-Hungarian cruiser Kaiserin Elizabeth, and one reconnaissance plane. The main lines of defense for Tsingtao lay along three hills, Mount Molka, Mount Bismarck, and Mount Litzis, extending from the Kaiserstuhl to Litzuner Heights. Each hill held howitzers and forts. A second line of defense were steep hills and a final line of defense was a network of trenches, batteries, and fortifications surrounding the town. The bay held mines along the approach to the harbor with coastal fortifications, four batteries, five readouts, but all with obsolete Chinese guns. The defenders were outnumbered 6 to 1, and the Japanese forces were battle-hardened with many officers who experienced the siege of Port Arthur during the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 to 1905. The Japanese also were utilizing Wakamiya seaplane carrier, which could launch four Farman Longhorn seaplanes for observation. The IGM began to blockade the coast of Kaushou on August the 27th, being reinforced by the Royal Navy as Wakamiya's planes performed reconnaissance on the triple-layer defenses of Tsingtao. 
The 23,000 troops of the 18th Division began landing on September the 2nd at Lungko amidst heavy floods. They were soon reinforced by British forces commanded by Brigadier General Nathan Walter Bairdson with the 2nd Battalion, South Wales Borderers, and the 36 Sikhs. The defenders were sent a telegraph from Kaiser Wilhelm II stating that the colony was not to be lost at any cost and that it would shame me more to surrender Tsingtao to the Japanese than Berlin to the Russians. On September the 2nd, the German gunboat SMS Jaguar caught the Japanese destroyer Shirotai, stranded off the coast, and managed to sink her. On September the 5th, the Japanese farman Longhorns made a complete survey of the harbor, the city, and the triple defense layers. This information was crucial to the seizures, who now knew the layout, and most importantly, that the German East Asian squadron had fled. With this information at hand, the IGN retired most of their modern warships they brought, a dreadnought, pre-dreadnought, and a cruiser, while the rest kept up the blockade. On September the 6th, the Wakamiya launched her planes again, this time with bomblets. The Longhorns made a bombing attack on the warships in Guizhou Bay. However, the SMS Kaiserin Elizabeth and the Jaguar had well-trained crews manning the anti-aircraft guns and repelled them. After this, SMS Kaizen and Elizabeth's 15cm and 4.7cm guns were removed to create batteries named Elizabeth, manned by her crew. Alfred Waldeck decided not to spread his forces too thin on the outer defense lines and instead concentrated all of his troops in the inner defensive circle close to the city. This was to prevent any gaps and breakthroughs. On September the 13th, the Japanese landed a cavalry corps to raid the German rearguard at Small. The defenders were forced to make a quick withdrawal, allowing the Japanese to take control of Katsho and the Sangtung Railway. Knowing his forces were dangerously overspread, General Kemio ordered them to fortify their positions as he landed more forces at Laoshan Bay. On September the 26th, General Kemio resumed the advance and the defenders were forced to retreat beyond the river Litsun. The Japanese crossed the river Paisha and swiftly made their way to the northern bank of Litsun. On September the 27th, they attacked Prince Heinrich Hill with a frontal assault, but were cut to pieces by the crossfire from four Maxim guns. Out in the bay, SMS Kaiserin Elizabeth and Leopard shelled the Japanese right flank, nearly routing them until the IGN attacked. The Comoran, Littis, and Luch were scuttled on September the 28th, the same day the remaining harbor ships failed to make a sortie, but the SMS Jaguar successfully shelled the Japanese cruiser Sakachio. More sorties were made later, such as when German torpedo boat S-90 escaped on the night of October the 17th. She sailed southeast of Zhejiao Bay and attacked the Takashio with two torpedoes detonating mines she was carrying, sinking her and killing 264 of her crew. The S-90 was unable to return to Tsingtao, as she had run out of fuel and was forced to scuttle herself in Chinese waters. Tiger was scuttled on October the 29th, SMS Kaiser and Elizabeth on November the 2nd, and last, Jaguar on November the 7th. On October the 31st, the Japanese surrounded the city and began to dig parallel trenches similar to what they did during the siege of Port Arthur. They then brought up their 11-inch howitzers to barrage the fortifications alongside the IGN bombardments. Under the constant cover of their own artillery, they advanced their trenches closer to the city. They bombarded the defenders for seven straight days with an average 100 siege guns shooting 1,200 shells per day. The defenders returned fire with their heavy guns on the port fortifications on the Japanese landward positions, but they soon ran out of ammo as of November the 6th. The defenders had a single Tabe aircraft flown by Lieutenant Gunther Pluschau, which was used frequently for reconnaissance. Pluschau had also made several attacks on blockading squadrons, dropping improvised explosives that amounted to some injuries, but no deaths. Pluschau claims that while making a sortie raid, he shot a Japanese pilot of a Longhorn, killing him and downing the aircraft, which would be the first aerial victory in aviation history, if it is true. On November the 6th, Pluschau flew out of Tsingtao, carrying the governor's last dispatches, which were to be forwarded to Berlin through neutral diplomatic channels. Luxia would make his way home by August 1915 after spending nine months in Shanghai, San Francisco, New York, and Gibraltar, where he was captured. Then he was sent to London as a prisoner of war, whereupon he escaped to the Netherlands and finally back to Germany. He would serve the remainder of the war in the German Naval Air Service, ranking as Capitaine Lieutenant in 1918. Then he became a renowned air explorer after the war and crashed in Patagonia in 1931. 
On the night of November the 6th, the Japanese bayonet charged the third line of defenses in waves. The defenders were almost out of ammunition and demoralized. They were quickly overwhelmed and many surrendered. In the morning, the Germans and Austro-Hungarians asked for a formal surrender. After negotiations were done, the terms were signed on November the 16th, 1914, and the Japanese and later British took possession of the colony. Upon entering the town, the German prisoners turned their backs to them. This land campaign claimed the lives of 733 Japanese, with 1,282 wounded, and the lives of 12 British with 53 wounded. The defenders lost 199 dead, with over 504 wounded. The defenders buried their dead at Tsing Tsao, while the surviving 4,700 prisoners were shipped to camps in Japan. They were treated quite well, and with respect in contrary to what is seen in World War II. After the Treaty of Versailles, they returned home in 1920. However, 170 Germans chose to remain in Japan, making a new life there. After such a long period of captivity, many most likely fell in love with the culture and met local women. Some even were part of the 3rd Marine Battalion Band Orchestra, which toured Japan in their uniforms from 1914 to 1918, becoming quite popular. When war was declared on Germany in 1914, the German East Asia Squadron withdrew from its base in Tsingtao and attempted to make its way east across the Pacific back to Germany. The East Asia Squadron numbered five major warships in the beginning under the command of Vice Admiral Maximilian Reichsgraf von Spee. There were the Skarnhorst class cruisers SMS Skarnhorst and SMS Gizenau, the Dresden class cruiser SMS Emden, the Bremen class cruiser SMS Leipzig, and the Konigsberg class cruiser SMS Nuremberg. At the outbreak of World War I, von Schwe found himself outnumbered and outgunned by enemy navies in the region. Also, nearly all the ships of the East Asia Squadron were dispersed at various island colonies on routine missions. Thus, the first action was to rendezvous at Pagan Island in the northern Marianas. At Pagan Island, the commanders planned the logistics of their long journey to Germany. Von Spee decided to take the fleet to South America, where it could make an attempt to break through to the Atlantic and then to Germany, while harassing Allied merchant traffic along the way. Lieutenant Commander Karl von Müller suggested that one cruiser be detached for independent operations in the Indian Ocean, and von Spee agreed to allow von Müller to take SMS Emden, the fastest cruiser, for the task. Von Müller began his raids, moving through the Colombo-Calcutta route, catching the Greek Collier SS Pontoporos, the Indus, Lovat, and Kambinga, and sinking two other ships. In late September of 1914, von Müller decided to bombard Madras, believing such an attack would demonstrate his freedom of maneuver and decrease British prestige with the local population. At around 8 p.m. on September the 22nd, SMS Emden entered the port of Madras and within 3,000 yards began to open fire. She set fire to two oil tanks, damaged three others, and damaged a merchant ship in the harbor. She fired over 130 rounds and forced Britain to stop shipping in the Bay of Bengal as a result. Then Emden sank the British merchantmen Tai Wurs, King Lund, Riberia, Foil, and captured the Collier Buresque on September the 25th while en route to Ceylon. Von Müller then planned a surprise attack on Penang of British Malaya. The Emden was outfitted to look like the British cruiser HMS Yarmouth and entered the harbor of Georgetown. Von Müller found the Russian protected cruiser Zemchik, a veteran of the Battle of Tsushima, in port and pulled up 300 yards alongside it, launching a torpedo before opening fire with its 10.5 centimeter guns. Emden shot a second torpedo, causing a tremendous explosion, tearing the ship apart and killing 81 sailors and wounding 129 men. The French cruiser D'Iberville and destroyer Thronde frantically fired at Emden, but she escaped unscathed. Upon leaving the harbor, the Emden ran into the French destroyer Mousquet, which was unprepared for combat and was quickly destroyed. The attack on Penang gave the Entente powers a significant shock, causing them to delay large convoys from Australia, as they believed they would require more powerful escorts now. Next, von Müller decided to attack the British coaling station in the Cocos Islands, where he intended to destroy the wireless station. The Emden reached the islands during the night of November the 8th, 1914, and set ashore a party led by Helmuth von Mucke at 6 a.m. to disable the wireless cable transmission station on Direction Island. 
The station was able to transmit a distress call before it was shut down, and Melbourne received the message, promptly sending light cruiser HMS Sydney to investigate. Meanwhile, the Germans destroyed the transmitting equipment and severed the undersea cables. At 9 a.m., the Emden saw smoke from the approaching Sydney and quickly sent signals to the shore party to hurry up, but were forced to cast off without them. At 9.40, the Emden fired first, raining shells for 10 minutes at a distance of 10,000 yards. 15 shells hit the Sydney, but only 5 exploded, sending shrapnel into the gun crews, exploding the mess deck, and killing 4 sailors, wounding 16. Sydney closed in and opened fire at a closer range, hitting Emden's steering gear, rangefinders, and voice pipes to the turrets and engineering. By 10.20 a.m., the two ships were dueling at 5.5 thousand yards, and Sydney fired torpedoes, which missed. Both ships continued to fire upon another, but Emden's guns were all destroyed, except for one. The Emden was drawing close to North Keeling Island, and Von Bülow ordered the ship to beach there, hoping to save his crew. The Emden ran aground at 11.20 a.m., prompting the Sydney to cease firing. At 4 p.m., the Sydney reached the Emden, signaling, Do you surrender? But the Emden only responded, What signal? No signal books. The Sydney took this as a ploy and fired two salvos into the Emden, killing 20 crewmen. The Emden then promptly raised the white flag. The Germans suffered 130 killed, with 69 wounded by the end of the battle. Von Bula and many of his officers were imprisoned in Malta at the Verdala Barracks. The rest of the crew were taken to Australia and placed in POW camps at Halsworthy, Trial Bay, and Barami. The SMS Emden destroyed two Entente warships and sank or captured 16 British steamers, one Russian merchant ship, totaling 70,825 gross register tons. It also captured and released four more British ships and took one British and Greek ship as colliers. Meanwhile, after the rendezvous at Pagan Island, von Spee dispatched the Nuremberg with the auxiliary cruiser Titiana to Honolulu to gather news, since many German undersea cables had been cut. They were then given orders to attack Fanning Island Cable Relay Station, and on September the 7th, 1914, the Nuremberg approached Fanning Island flying a French flag, prompting the island staff to hoist the British flag. The British realized it was a German ship just as the crew were coming onto the island and the operators sent a message to Sova warning, it's the Nuremberg, they are firing. The Germans severely damaged the cable station, amounting to over $150,000 in damage. Von Schwie's first target was to be Papit in Tahiti. Von Schwie hoped to seize their coal and destroy any Allied shipping he could find in their harbor. Along the way, Nuremberg and Titiana returned to his squadron, and Von Schwie made a reconnaissance at Bora Bora to learn what forces defended Papit. It turned out Papit was defended by 25 colonial infantry, 20 gender arms, and 160 sailors under Lt. Maxim Dresdemau, who had some land batteries, armored cars, and an old wooden gunboat named Zelle. The German cruisers heavily outgunned them, and with 1,500 sailors, outmanned them also. At 7 a.m. on September the 22nd, 1914, two identified cruisers approached the harbor of Papit, raising the French alarms. The two cruisers raised the German colors, signaling for the town to surrender, but they refused. Von Spee began to shell the shore batteries and town from 6,600 yards, as the French land batteries and Zele fired back, scoring no hits. The German cruisers soon turned their attention to the shipping in the harbor, where they saw Zele and an old captured German ship named Valkyr. Von Spee fired upon both vessels, destroying them, as Pepite's inhabitants fled the town, being shelled, starting fires. The French destroyed their coal deposits as soon as combat commenced, and the sight of the smoke was evident. Thus, von Spee withdrew his ships at 11 a.m., having done enough damage. Because von Spee was denied the coal at Papit, he sent his forces to Easter Island to coal up. The Battle of Papit now meant von Spee had lost the element of surprise in the Pacific, and his squadron was being hunted. Von Spee decided to take the squadron around the Cape Horn to break through to the Atlantic and then to Germany. Off the coast of Chile, the squadron met up with the light cruiser Dresden, which had been raiding in the area. On October the 4th, 1914, the British learnt from an intercepted radio message that von Spee planned to attack the shipping on trade routes along the west coast of South America. Rear Admiral Sir Christopher Craddock began to patrol the area with a squadron consisting of the armoured cruisers HMS Good Hope, Monmouth, light cruiser Glasgow, armed merchantmen Otranto, and pre-dreadnought battleship Canopus. 
The squadron was obsolete and lightly armored, crewed by inexperienced naval reservists. Von Spee's force were led by officers handpicked by the Grand Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz. The German cruisers had an overwhelming advantage in range and firepower with 8.2-inch guns on the Scarnhorst and Gisenau versus 6-inch guns on the Monmouth and Good Hope, and only two 9.2-inch guns in single turrets on the Good Hope. A major problem for the British was the slow-moving Canopus, which hindered their operations. Thus Craddock left Canopus behind to escort some colliers as he left around the Cape Horn hunting the Germans. Von Spee was hunting HMS Glasgow en route to Coronel Harbour when Craddock was given word of their location. At 9.15am on November 1, 1914, the Glasgow left Coronel Harbour to link up with Craddock in the west. The Germans approached the area at full speed, around 20 knots, and at 4.20pm reached the Glasgow and the slower-moving Otranto. The two British ships began to flee south. Craddock was faced with a hard choice. He could now take his three cruisers capable of 20 knots and flee, abandoning the Otranto, to the Germans or to stay in fight with the Otranto. Craddock decided to fight, and at 5.10 p.m. he moved southeast, drawing closer to the Germans to engage. Von Spee turned his ships away, maintaining a distance, sailing parallel at 14,000 yards. And at 6.50 p.m., as the sun was setting, Von Spee began firing at 12,000 yards. German shells managed to hit the 9.2-inch guns on Good Hope within the first five minutes, leaving Good Hope with only her 6-inch guns and Otranto's 4.7-inch guns with insufficient range to match the Germans' 8-inch guns. Craddock attempted to close the distance requiring 6,000 yards to hit the Germans. However, by this point the Germans' fire had become much more accurate and Good Hope and Monmouth were being battered, catching fire, presenting themselves as targets as it got dark. Good Hope was hit at 7.50 p.m., exploding her forward section as she broke apart and sank. The Skarnhorst began to target Monmouth as Gesenau, Leipzig, and Dresden attacked Glasgow. The German light cruiser's 4-inch guns left the Glasgow unscathed with only Gesenau's 8-inch guns doing some light damage. Because of the darkness, Glasgow was able to turn south and escape. The slower-moving Nuremberg arrived late to the battle, but sighted the badly damaged Monmouth with her searchlights. She sent the surrender signal, but Monmouth declined, and thus she fired upon the ship, sinking her. Von Spee had word that the British had a battleship in the area and decided to flee north. 1,660 British crew had died, including Admiral Craddock. Glasgow and Otranto had both managed to escape, suffering many hits and wounded men. The Germans suffered only three wounded on the Gisenau, which had been hit by four shells. The Battle of Coronel was the first naval defeat for the British since the Battle of Lake Champlain in the War of 1812. The Germans had used half of their ammunition at the battle, which could not be replenished. In response to the loss at the Battle of Coronel, the British formed a new squadron to hunt down the German raiders. The British force, led by Admiral Sir Deviton Sturdy, consisted of the battle cruisers HMS Invincible and Inflexible, armored cruisers Carnivon, Cornwall, and Kent, and light cruisers Bristol and Glasgow. The British battle cruisers could make 25.5 knots versus von Spee's 22.5 knots and they held eight 12-inch guns, significantly outgunning von Spee. The British force arrived at Stanley Harbour on December 7, 1914, proceeding to coal up. Von Spee's vanguard of Gesenau and Nuremberg approached Stanley first, not realizing the force that awaited them. To the shock of the Germans, they were fired upon by HMS Canopus, which had been grounded as a guardian ship at Stanley behind a hill to act as a makeshift defense battery. The Germans simultaneously saw the distinctive tripod masts of the British battlecruisers in the port and von Spee gave orders to flee to open sea. Sturdy's force took off in pursuit by 10 a.m. At 1 p.m., the British battlecruisers, sailing at 25 knots, caught up to the Germans first and opened up fire at 16,000 yards. The Gesenau was hit three times in the aft starboard's middle deck and ammunition hold. The Germans fired back, managing to hit the Invincible, but only doing minor damage. By 2 p.m., the Germans turned south in search of bad weather to aid their escape. The duels continued as Sturdy detached his three cruisers to chase Leipzig and Nuremberg. Then the two battlecruisers managed to present their broadsides to Scarnhorst and Gisenau at 3 p.m. Von Spee could do nothing but try to draw in closer in order to fire back, which only exposed his ships even more. At 3.30 p.m., the ships began to exchange fire, 
Scar and Horse took extensive damage and sank in a fiery storm by 4.17 p.m., taking Von Spee, two of his sons, and her entire crew of 795 men with her. The Geza now fired back and evaded fire until 5.17 p.m. when she ran out of ammunition. The British crossed her T, firing upon her, and she began to list and slowly sank by 6.02 p.m., sending 190 survivors into the water. Both British battlecruisers had received 40 hits between them, with only one crew member dying and four injured. Meanwhile, the SMS Nuremberg and Leipzig were fleeing when at 5.30 p.m. Nuremberg had exhausted her engines and turned to battle the Kent. Nuremberg closed in, 3,000 yards firing all of her guns. The more heavily armored Kent shot Nuremberg over 40 times, taking out her boilers, steering, and sending her aflame from bow to stern. Nuremberg expended all of her ammunition, hitting Kent 38 times before capsizing and sinking by 7.27 p.m. The duel was a slaughterfest. Only 11 men were picked up out of the water from Nuremberg, while Kent only suffered 8 deaths. Leipzig was chased by Cornwall and Glasgow. Soon Leipzig also exhausted her engines and turned to engage the enemy. Leipzig fired at Glasgow at 3 p.m., bearing her 6-inch guns and then her 4-inch guns when distance was closed. By continuously turning her broadside to duel Glasgow, Cornwall gradually caught up by 4.17 p.m. Cornwall opened fire with her nine 6-inch guns at 10,500 yards, battering Leipzig. The duel had turned into an execution as Leipzig lost its steering, ammunition, and was on fire. By 7 p.m., all she had left was torpedoes, and she fired all of them, all of them missing. The crew began to run to the decks to jump ship, as British shells sent shrapnel across the decks, causing carnage. Two distress flares were shot up, and the British ships seized fire as Leipzig capsized and sank, leaving only 18 survivors scrambling in the water. The British had around 10 deaths and 19 wounded. The battle was over, and SMS Dresden was the only ship to escape. 215 Germans survived and were taken prisoner. The German East Asia Squadron effectively ceased to exist. The Dresden and some auxiliary ships tried to retreat to the Pacific to continue raiding, but HMS Glasgow caught up to them at the island of Massetere, and Dresden was no match. She was destroyed with 315 of her remaining crew interned at Chile until the end of the war. When World War I broke out, China remained neutral, and she was fragmented, financially chaotic, unstable politically, and militarily weak. Now, in a previous episode, we mentioned one of the major events that kicked off the start of World War I in Asia. That was the Siege of Tsingtao, in which Japan defeated the Germans and occupied the port city. China could do little to nothing about this. Yuan Shukai had secretly offered the British diplomat, John Jordan, 50,000 troops to retake Tsingtao from the Germans, but this was refused. Japan not only occupied Tsingtao, they occupied portions of Shandong province and built military railways in northeastern Shandong, appropriated Chinese telegraph facilities, post offices, and went as far as trafficking opium. They levied taxes on local Chinese inhabitants, requested labor, materials, and attempted to appoint over 40 Japanese custom officers. Now, Japan was not done with its violations of Chinese sovereignty. In 1915, Japan sought to officially keep its newly acquired conquered German territories in China and extend upon those it won during the First Sino-Japanese War and Russo-Japanese War. China had recently tossed off the yoke of the Qing Dynasty and had established the New Republic of China. It was also fragmented and vulnerable. Japan saw this as an opportunity to gain everything it wanted. On January 18, 1915, the Japanese minister in Peking, Hikieki, personally presented what came to be known as the 21 Demands to Yuan Shikai. The demands were divided into several groups, stipulating economic, territorial, diplomatic, and political influence. Group 1 confirmed Japan's recent seizure of the German-occupied territories and expanded upon the influence over railways, coasts, and major cities within Shandong province. Group 2 extended the leasehold over the South Manchurian Railway Zone for 99 years and expanded Japan's sphere of influence in southern Manchuria and eastern Inner Mongolia. Group 3 gave Japan control of the Han Yiping Mining and Metallurgical Complex in Central China, and Group 4 barred China from giving any further coastal or island concessions to foreign powers. 
Last, the most egregious was Group 5, stipulating that China would hire Japanese advisors who would effectively control China's finance, police, capability to build railways, Buddhist temples, and schools. Japan would also gain control of Fujian. If the Chinese government fully accepted these demands, it would result in China being reduced to a vassal state, if not a colony, under Japan. Minister Hiki expected Yuan Shikai to maintain a strict secrecy about these demands, but soon word got out. The international community did not react as forcefully as China would have hoped. After all, the Entente powers were preoccupied fighting the central powers. Obviously, none of them were coming to China's aid. It was only the United States, which remained neutral at this point, who issued a formal diplomatic objection, stating it would not recognize any agreements that might contravene the open-door policy of 1899. The Japanese ignored this declaration, but the Genro intervened and deleted Group 5's demands from the document as these proved to be far too overbearing. On May 7, 1915, a new set of 13 demands was sent in the form of an ultimatum with a two-day deadline for a response. Yuan Shikai was competing with other warlords in China to become the de facto leader of the fractured country and was in no position to risk war with Japan. On May 8, 1915, Yuan Shikai accepted the 13 demands, and the final form was signed on May 25th. The reaction of the people was extremely negative towards Yuan Shikai, though it should be noted the Chinese government did its best to thwart most of the damage. They had stalled the process, leaked the demands to the international community, hoping for some intervention, and after helped protract negotiations seeking to affect Japanese domestic politics by mobilizing support for the general. Indeed, the results of the 13 demands were actually far more negative for Japan than positive without Group 5. The new treaty gave Japan little more than it already had in China. The demands hurt Japan's already bad relations with the United States and even dampened the relations with their closest ally, Britain, who saw Japan trying to become a protectorate over all of China. Of course, the outcry of the Chinese people towards Japan was highly negative and would contribute later to the May 4th movement of 1919. Now, we have already stated China remained neutral at the outbreak of World War I, but by 1916, certain nations were struggling to come up with new ways to win the war. British Minister John Jordan, after refusing Yuan Shikai's offer to retake Tsingtao, offered China the opportunity to join the Entente powers, provided that Japan and the other allies accepted her as a partner. Japan refused to allow Chinese soldiers to fight, hoping to secure her authority as the powerhouse in the East. While Chinese citizens were not allowed by the Chinese government to participate in the fighting, this did not stop them from other actions. In 1916, the French government approached China, asking to recruit its citizens for non-combatant use. A contract was agreed upon on May 14, 1916, supplying 50,000 laborers who would make their way to Marseille in July of 1916. This was followed up by Britain's War Committee in London, who formed the Chinese Labor Corps, with its main recruiting base established in Wei Highway on October the 31st, 1916. The first transport ship carried 1,088 laborers sailing from Wei Highway on January 18, 1917. The journey took three months. Each volunteer received an embarkment fee of 20 yuan, followed by 10 yuan a month paid to their families in China. By the end of the war, this would account for roughly $2.2 billion earned by Chinese laborers. As a result of German submarine attacks, Britain needed a safe route and shipped 84,000 Chinese laborers through Canada. This was done in absolute secrecy, as at the time Canada had the Discriminatory Chinese Immigration Act of 1885 and the Chinese head tax. Thus, they had boarded trains journeying 6,000 kilometers from Vancouver to Montreal, never leaving the train. As reported by the Halifax Herald in 1920, they were herded like so many cattles in cars forbidden to leave the train and guarded like criminals. It was a grueling experience to be sure. China began to ship thousands of men to Britain, France, and Russia. These non-combatants would repair tanks, assemble shells, transport supplies like munition, and dig trenches amongst many other things. They would work on average 10 hours a day, 7 days a week, and many had to work in military combat zones, often under fire. Most of these laborers came from Shandong province, who hoped their actions would allow China to regain complete control over the province upon winning the war. As mentioned, many of these Chinese laborers were sent to Russia, 
Chinese scholars estimate up to a possible 200,000 Chinese laborers worked in Russia. They worked in coal mines, factories, railways, carried ammunition, and dug trenches in the Eastern Front. Most of their recruitment was done in northeastern China by the private companies like Yixian Company. There was a significant difference between Chinese laborers working in the West versus the East. In the West, Chinese laborers worked under government contracts of that of Britain and France, who managed them. In the East, the Russian government did not manage them. It was actually private merchants. This meant many Chinese in the East did not receive adequate sheltering, clothing, or food. Conditions were extremely harsh, and often Chinese laborers would simply be left on their own. Many of these laborers were employed to build a 1,044-kilometer railway linking St. Petersburg to the Newport and Murmansk. This meant they had to lay a line across frozen marshes, lakes, rocky terrains, and through countryside that was uninhabited and could supply nothing but timber. They worked 24 hours a day. In the cold, nights could reach negative 40 degrees Celsius, and many died of the extreme cold, lack of nutrition, and disease. With so many Chinese scattered about Russia, during the Russian Revolution, many joined the New Red Army. Many Chinese laborers truly sympathized with the Bolshevik cause, others simply joined the Red Army as a means to survive. Those who did join the Red Army often did so for food or the opportunity to get back home as the revolution left many stranded. Ren Fuxian was China's first Bolshevik, and he was the commander of the Chinese Red Eagle Battalion. Estimates vary significantly, but it is estimated up to 40,000 Chinese laborers joined the Red Army fighting in multiple fronts like Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, the Caucasus, Volga, and Siberia. They had no attachment to Russia or its places, and thus, they were very useful as executioners, and many were used as shock troops, as no one expected to be attacked by Chinese. Roughly 140,000 Chinese laborers served on the Western Front during and after the war. 100 of these served in the British Chinese Labor Corps, 40,000 with the French, and hundreds of Chinese students served as translators. It should be noted that the Chinese government and many intellectuals saw the overseas work as an enormous opportunity for the Chinese youth to learn new technical skills and ingenuity which could be brought back to the homeland. Then on February the 17th, 1917, the French passenger ship SS Athos was sunk by the German U-boat SM U-65 off the coast of Malta. The ship was carrying 900 Chinese workers and 543 of them were tragically killed. The United States had recently severed diplomatic ties to Germany and as a result of its unrestricted submarine warfare pushed China to do the same. China severed diplomatic ties with Germany in March. The United States further advised China that if they wished to be brought to the peace agreements, China should declare war on Germany. Thus, China took this advice and declared war on the Central Powers on August 14, 1917. China proceeded to take back the remaining concessions of Germany and Austro-Hungary in Tianjin and Hankou. The Chinese government also cancelled reparation payments to Germany and Austro-Hungary that had been lingering since the Boxer Rebellion. The Chinese government considered sending a token combat force into the Western Front, but never ended up doing so. China did, however, send 2,300 troops to Vladivostok in August of 1918 to protect Chinese interests during the Siberian intervention. These Chinese forces fought against the Bolsheviks and Cossacks. The Chinese forces eventually occupied Outer Mongolia and Tuva. When the war came to an end, many of the Chinese laborers remained employed to recover bodies of dead soldiers clear mines and refill miles of trenches they had dug themselves. Each Chinese laborer was identified by a reference number and were shipped home eventually. Around 5 to 7,000 stayed in France, forming the nucleus of a later Chinese community in Paris. This also occurred in many other cities like London. Between December 1918 and September 1920, most Chinese laborers were shipped home. It is estimated around 2,000 Chinese laborers died during the war many from the 1918 flu pandemic. But many Chinese scholars argue the total could be as high as 20,000. When Germany declared its surrender on November the 11th, 1918, expectations in China were quite high. When the news reached China, the government immediately declared a three-day national holiday to commence upon the armistice. China achieved its primary goal, that being granted a seat at the post-war peace conference. China was given two seats as they had not supplied any combat troops. Chinese delegation was led by Lu Tsengxiang, who was accompanied by Wellington Ko and Cao Rulin. Japan, on the other hand, was given five seats as they had contributed combat troops. 
Britain and France had promised Japan it could keep the holdings it acquired during the war, which included the former German holdings. In Article 156 of the Treaty of Versailles, the official transfer of Shandong Peninsula was given to the Empire of Japan rather than being returned to China. China denounced this transfer, stating Shandong was the birthplace of Confucius, the greatest Chinese philosopher, and it would be on par to Christians conceding Jerusalem. China demanded Shandong Peninsula be returned to China, an abolition of all privileges afforded to foreign powers in China, such as extraterritoriality, and to cancel the 13 demands with the Japanese government. The Western powers refused all of China's demands and dismissed them. As a result, Wellington Co. refused to sign the Treaty of Versailles in protest. The backlash towards the Treaty of Versailles in China was immense. In retaliation for the Chinese government's weak response and the actions of the Western powers, students all over China protested against the government's decision to allow Japan to retain the territories in Shandong province. These student demonstrations sparked a nationwide protest and spurred an incredible upsurge in Chinese nationalism. This event became known as the May 4th Movement. The movement increasingly saw support from the working class, and when they entered the political arena, things escalated dramatically. The center of demonstrations moved from Beijing to Shanghai, where the working class replaced the students and began massive strikes. As we already mentioned, many Chinese stranded in Russia joined the Red Army for various reasons. Marxism began to take hold with many of the working class in China, and the October Revolution gave them direction. Eventually, in 1921, the Chinese Communist Party was established on July the 1st, and this would feed into one of the worst civil wars in human history by 1927. Japan and Britain signed the Anglo Alliance of 1902 for the primary purpose of mutual recognition of each party's interest in China and to oppose Russian expansion in the Far East. Yet another provision was the promise of support if either signatory became involved in a war with more than one power. This clause was triggered when Britain declared war on Austria-Hungary on August the 12th, 1914, having previously declared war on Germany on August the 4th. Now this clause facilitated Japanese entry into World War I, but did not require Japan to do so. While the events unfolding in Europe were of little interest to Japan, the conflict meant that Western powers were distracted from their interest in China and the Pacific, and a nation like Germany could not hope to defend their belongings. Japan thus saw an opportunity to enhance its standing in the region. On August the 7th, three days after declaring war on Germany, Britain officially asked for Japanese assistance in locating and destroying the raiders of the Imperial German Navy operating in and around Chinese waters. Japan sent Germany an ultimatum on August the 15th, which went unanswered, and thus Japan formally declared war on Germany on August the 23rd, and on Austria-Hungary on August the 25th, as they had left one cruiser, SMS Kaiserin Elizabeth, in Tsingtao. In September of 1914, the IGA requested that the Japanese Red Cross form three squads each consisting of one surgeon and 20 nurses and be dispatched to Europe for a five-month assignment. The team left Japan between October and December of 1914, with assignments in Petrograd, Southampton, and Paris. The arrival of these nurses received wide press coverage and their host countries asked for the teams to extend their assignments to 15 months. While this operation was absolutely a humanitarian cause, it was also part of an overall strategy of the Japanese government to earn recognition on the world stage. The European Entente powers formally gave Japan the status of ally, guaranteeing support at the prospective peace conference for any possessions Japan might take from Germany in China. Britain also asked Japan to help protect the Allied shipping lanes of commerce in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. As we mentioned in previous episodes, the German East Asia Squadron fled China when Japan entered World War I. Nonetheless, the IGN actively hunted German and Austro-Hungarian shipping within its range of operations. We also mentioned in a previous episode, the first large event of World War I in Asia was the Siege of Tsingtao, which saw the Japanese defeat Germany and occupy the port city. After this, acting independent of the civil government, the IGN sought to seize German colonial possessions in the Pacific. Britain was annoyed by this situation and quietly warned the Japanese government that they should not occupy German islands in the South Pacific, as they were desired by Australia and New Zealand, and that they should also not seize the Dutch East Indies. Japan ignored the quiet statements, leading Britain to make the statements public, which humiliated Tokyo. Japan decided to enter the war with no restrictions, but chose not to take the German possessions south of the equator. The IGN, as we mentioned, were tasked with hunting German raiders and protecting Allied shipping within the Pacific and Indian Oceans. 
While the IGA was launching its campaign against Tsingtao, the IGN set out a two-pronged plan to hunt the German East Asia Squadron. The IGN formed two task forces, the 1st and 2nd South Seas Squadrons, which left the harbors of Yokohama and Sasebo on September the 14th. Vice Admiral Yamaha Tenyan and Rear Admiral Matsumura Tetsuo led the two squadrons and were given strict instructions from the Navy Minister Yashihiro Rokaru not to occupy any part of the German territories. The 1st South Sea Squadron, under the command of Vice Admiral Yamaya Tanin, arrived with battlecruiser Kuriyama, two cruisers and two destroyers at the Jaluit Ayatol on September the 29th. He ignored the Navy Ministry's directive and seized the island without encountering any German resistance. He was then given orders to immediately withdraw and he complied, falling back to the Anywaitok Ayatol. On October the 3rd, the IGN General Staff convinced Navy Minister Yashihiro to allow temporary occupation and thus Yamaya reoccupied the Jaluit on October the 12th. His squadron followed this up by seizing the eastern Caroline Islands of Kasuaya, Penope, and Truk. Simultaneously, the 2nd South Sea Squadron with battleship Satsuma and two cruisers took control of the western Caroline Islands of Yap and Palias. On October the 14th, they captured Saipan in the Mariana Islands archipelago. By the end of 1914, the 2nd South Sea Squadron was converted into a provisional South Seas Islands Defense Force. With the establishment of this, the IGN now asserted its control over the region. It also invigorated further southern advances in the future. The IGN respected the British wishes for them not to attack German possessions south of the equator that had been designated for Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand invaded German Samoa, which ended without bloodshed. Australia invaded German New Guinea and encountered 300 Germans and native policemen. The invasion saw the Battle of Bita Paka and the Siege of Toma between September 11th to the 17th. Australia would also take the Bismarck Archipelago and Nauru. In late August of 1914, the IGN deployed their naval forces to defend against German raiders. Battlecruiser Congo patrolled sea lanes in the Pacific as Ibuki and Chikuma hunted for SMS Emden around Singapore. On February the 16th, 1915, the third IGN squadron received orders to help suppress a Sepoy mutiny occurring in Singapore. Rear Admiral Tsuchiya Mitsukane sent Marines to do the task, but was extremely displeased with the orders and secretly told his men not to kill or wound any Sepoy and instead try to encourage them to surrender. The IGN at this time formed the North American Task Force to defend the west coast of Canada and Allied shipping. When World War I broke out, most of Canada's ships were tasked with the defense of the Atlantic shipping lanes to the UK. Some newspapers at the time claimed if it was not for the IGN, the German Imperial Navy would have shelled Victoria and Vancouver would have been brought to fragments. Back in 1914, Britain had requested Japan to send naval units to the Mediterranean theater of operations, but Japan refused as it was preoccupied with Tsingtao. Britain persisted to ask them again between December 14th to January 1915, but Japan continuously refused, stating to send IGN forces so far away would leave the homeland at risk for an American invasion. Do not forget, the United States and Japan had a very tense relationship at this time, and America held a significant presence in the Philippines. Then in February of 1916, the British offered the Anglo-Japanese Treaty of Commerce and Navigation, allowing Japanese immigrants entry into Australia, New Zealand, and that Japanese doctors could practice in British colonies. This offer led the IGN to form the first special squadron that was tasked with escorting troop ships from Australia and New Zealand to the Middle East, but Japan was not yet ready to send a full fleet into the Mediterranean. Then in 1917, Germany issued a declaration of unrestricted submarine warfare against Allied shipping. Before this event, the British were still antagonistic towards Japan's occupation of previously held German territories in Asia and the Pacific. Now Germany and Austro-Hungary had over 34 U-boats operating from the Adriatic, destroying Allied shipping within the Mediterranean Sea. Britain formally offered it would support Japan's claims to the former German territories if Japan helped in the Mediterranean Sea. The IGN quickly established the 2nd Special Squadron, led by Rear Admiral Seito Kozo, consisting of three cruisers and 12 destroyers. They sailed through Colombo, Aden, Port Said, and arrived at Malta by April 16, 1917. The IGN was tasked with escorting troop ships heading from Malta to Salonika, from Alexandria to Taranto to Marseille. The IGN played a crucial role in one of the most spectacular rescue missions of World War I. 
On May the 4th, 1917, the British troopship SS Transylvania was torpedoed by German U-boat 63 off the Gulf of Genoa. IGN destroyers Sakaki and Matsu managed to force the submarine to submerge and saved around 3,000 men from the sinking ship. During their operations in the Mediterranean Sea, the IGN escorted over 21 British warships and more than 700 Allied transports, altogether carrying more than 500,000 passengers and covering 240,000 nautical miles. The British were so impressed by the performance of the IGN, they eventually turned over two Royal Navy destroyers to be manned by IGN crews for the duration of the war. On June the 11th, the Sakaki was torpedoed and lost 59 crew, including her captain, but managed to limp back to Malta. Although the IGN did not claim any U-boats sunk, Allied losses in the Mediterranean sharply decreased, the IGN in return absorbed British technology and innovative tactics against U-boats. Upon its return after the war, the second special squadron brought back seven German U-boats to study, which would contribute heavily to the IGN's ambitious program of building a submarine fleet for intercepting the U.S. fleet in the Pacific. What also occurred in 1917 was America entering the war on April the 6th. Japan and the United States found themselves on the same side. Despite their increasingly tense relations over China and the Pacific, both countries began talks to reduce the tension. The Lansing Ishii Agreement was signed on November the 2nd, 1917, to settle disputes the two nations had in regards to China. Both nations agreed to respect the independence and territoriality of China, but also the U.S. would recognize Japan's special interest in certain areas, particularly in Manchuria. While this was a landmark in Japan-American relations, for the Japanese, the agreement still reiterated its inequality with white people. Everything was looking great for Japan at this point. They were winning international prestige, and for quite limited cost. They also were profiting heavily from the war, as Japan increasingly was filling out orders needed for war materials for its European allies. The wartime boom helped diversify the country's industry, increasing its exports, and transformed Japan from a debtor to a creditor for the first time. Exports quadrupled between 1913 to 1918, though this did lead to a rapid inflation and the August 1918 rice riots. Then an enormous event unfolded. The Russian Revolution fueled a civil war. In 1918, following the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, Japan alongside Britain, Canada, China, Italy, France, and the United States sent forces to aid the White Army against the Bolshevik-led Red Army. A 50,000-strong Czechoslovakian legion was left stranded in non-allied territory within Soviet Russia, and they attempted to fight their way out to Vladivostok, traveling along the Bolshevik-held Trans-Siberian Railway. France asked if the Japanese could intervene in 1917, but Japan declined. Then in February of 1918, the IGA general staff began to explore the possibility that the Tsarist collapse might offer an opportunity to free Japan from any future threat from Russia by detaching Siberia and forming an independent buffer state. In July of 1918, the United States asked Japan for assistance in supplying 7,000 troops as part of an international coalition of 25,000 troops planned to support the rescue of the Czechoslovakian Legion and to secure a large stockpile of weapons and ammunition in Siberia. Japan began landing troops in Vladivostok on a large scale starting on August 8, 1918, and by the end of the month had over 18,000 IJ forces, with a further 6,000 moving up through Manchuria and Munchuli. By October, Japan had sent 70,000 forces, dwarfing all the other powers, and 10 times the amount they were asked to bring. By August 18th, the IGA general, Otani Kikuzo, assumed command of all Allied forces. The IGA sought to send so many troops to Siberia in order to secure an autonomous state east of Lake Baikal as a buffer state. All the Allied powers had envisioned operations only in the vicinity of Vladivostok and were very wary of Japan's intentions. Within months, the IGA had penetrated as far as west of Lake Baikal and Buryatia. Japan's Zaibatsu, like Mitsubishi, opened offices in Vladivostok, Kabarovsk, Nikolivetsk on Amur, and Chita, bringing over 50,000 civilian settlers. The Americans were particularly suspicious of the Japanese as they began to occupy all ports and major towns in the Russian maritime provinces and in Siberia east of the city of Chita. One major incident occurred between America and Japan at Evgenivka railway station. An American unit of the 27th Infantry Regiment, Wolfhounds, were stationed there, and a private named Little Smith was guarding a portion of the station when a Japanese unit was disembarking from a train. 
One of the Japanese soldiers tried to pass into the American section, but was blocked by Smith. The enraged Japanese soldier smacked Smith across the head with his canteen strap, and in response, Smith allegedly stabbed him with a bayonet. The Japanese apprehended Smith, threatening to kill him, which alerted the Wolfhound's regiment. Their commander, Major Fitzhu Lee Alderdice, marched on the station with 250 men to free Smith. When they arrived, a Japanese captain tried to stab an American, doing no real damage. Major T. Ari, commanding the Japanese unit, arrived and negotiated with the Americans after. Some men almost broke out into a gunfight. Many more similar situations would occur between the Japanese and American forces in Siberia during this time. In the summer of 1919, the white regime in Siberia collapsed and the Allied intervention forces began to withdraw, with most of them leaving by November the 1st. The Japanese decided to stay, in order to achieve their underlying goal to set up a buffer state and to stop the spread of communism in Manchuria or Korea. Throughout the intervention, the Red Army and Japanese caused significant casualties upon another. It's estimated 3,116 Japanese died from combat and disease while the Red Army lost 7,791. This continued until June of 1922 when Japan finally announced its withdrawal. The ordeal was quite a failure for Japan. Alongside the deaths, the Japanese treasury spent 900 million yen on the venture and it failed to gain any control of eastern Siberia, antagonized the new Soviet Union, and further antagonized its relations with America. After the surrender of Germany on November the 11th, 1918, came the Paris Peace Conference in Versailles. Japan was given a seat at the table alongside the great powers. In fact, Japan got to sit right beside the Big Four. Tokyo gained a permanent seat on the Council of the New League of Nations. The 1919 Treaty of Versailles awarded Japan the territories it acquired from Germany. Versailles also offered a chance to overturn the imposed racial inferiority of Japan, and it finally allowed them to take the rightful place among the victorious great powers as equals. Thus Japan proposed an amendment to the Treaty of Versailles, known as the Racial Equality Proposal. The proposal received a majority vote on the first day, with 11 out of 17 delegates voting yes and the rest not being present. However, it was President Woodrow Wilson of the United States who overturned it by saying although the proposal had been approved by a clear majority, the particular matter had strong opposition manifest itself and that on this issue a unanimous vote would be required. Another voice that raised opposition was Australian Prime Minister Billy Hughes that stated the amendment would mean the end of the white Australian immigration policy. Thus, Japan emerged as one of the great powers after World War I, but not racially equal. Japan had seen the situation play out first in the First Sino-Japanese War, then after the Russo-Japanese War, and now again after World War I. It was now obvious and clear to Japan it would never be treated as a true equal. Japan was humiliated by this and began to alienate itself from the other great powers, embracing militarism, imperialism, and expansion. Many historians argue this rejection of the amendment would be one of the major causes of conflict leading to World War II. Over 1,723 Asians came to the battlefields of Europe and the Middle East between 1914 and 1919. This came at a time when the governments and societies of Asia were facing an onslaught of Western imperialism and the imposition of unequal treaties. At the outbreak of World War I, Vietnam was a French protectorate and part of French Indochina. When France entered World War I, they began to press gang thousands of volunteers for service in Europe, and this led to considerable social upheaval, such as rioting in places like Cochin, China. France put into service 92,411 Vietnamese. To be accepted, a volunteer had to pass a medical examination and be at least 1.5 meters tall. Similar to recruiting done in many other countries, men were rejected for various reasons, such as eyesight or hearing problems, malnutrition, deformities, and so on. Most of the men that were rejected would not be released, but instead placed into labor corps. Each recruit received a bonus of 200 francs and a monthly salary. Their families would receive a monthly allowance. If they died during the war, 
their wife and children under 18 years of age would receive their pension. Similar to the millions of young men in the rest of the world, many Vietnamese initially were eager to sign up. Stories told in the letters of the first round of volunteers who left for France in 1915 inspired their desire to fulfill Mok Sang Ho, a dream of adventure. Their stories described majestic churches, tall monuments, paved streets, large ships and shops, and wealthy residential-areas in France. Many were attracted by the terms of employment listed on the Yit T, notice boards or official announcements, posted in the communal centers around the country. It promised bonuses, family allowances, pensions, honorary titles of the Mandarinate system, posthumous honors, and an exemption from the head tax, which was a great relief for poor peasant families. Pictures showed Vietnamese soldiers posing with French soldiers and officers, implying that if they joined the colonial army, they would have allied soldiers for Ban Dong Ming, comrades, and French officers for Ban Tong Ching, fellow cabinets. Thus it all seemed a bright future for the volunteers, prosperity and an elevation of social status and racial equality. Poverty was the main motivation for peasants to volunteer, especially in Tonkin and Annam, where the population density was very high. Prior to World War I, and even during 1915 to 1916, there were many natural disasters, like a series of floods and droughts, which led to famines, unemployment, and destitution. In France, the soldiers formed 18 battalions of the colonial infantry known as les Bataillons de l'Infanterie Coloniale comprising four combat battalions and 14 labor battalions. These battalions provided support to France, in the Balkans and in the Middle East. On the front lines, these battalions were often broken up into small units and attached to different regiments of the French army. According to historian Maurice Rive, the first Indochinese conflict of World War I was when crew members of the Musquette squared off against the German cruiser SMS Emden on October the 29th of 1914. Three Vietnamese died in the sea battle and could be counted as the first victims of the Great War for Indochina. For soldiers who had looked forward to having an exciting adventure, they got a lot more than they bargained for. Two battalions of the Vietnamese soldiers who would serve in France for the 7e and 21e Bataillon de Marche Indochinois. They landed in Marseille on February the 16th of 1916 and underwent training at Fréjus until April of 1917 and were soon sent to the front. In France, the winters were much harsher and colder than those in Tonkin and Annam. According to one sergeant, Fung, it was so cold that saliva immediately froze after it was spat on the ground. The chill of winter pierces one's heart. When the Vietnamese arrived at the front lines, many immediately requested to go into combat. They thought shooting the enemy was going to be easy. One only had to aim at the targets and squeeze the trigger. The 4e Compagnie saw action with the 12th Infantry Division during the Second Battle of N on the Chemin des Dames on May the 5th to the 7th of 1917. They were following up the regiment's attacks and tasked with resupplying the forward troops consolidating trenches, and organizing captured territory. Over 150 Vietnamese were captured by Germans at the Battle of Chemin des Dames in May of 1918. When the Ministry of War tried to locate them, they found out that they had been sent to labor camps in Romania and Africa, and that most of them had died. In June of 1918, the 4e Compagnie were in the trenches in the Vosges where they were repulsed by intense German attacks. This was followed up by two attacks in October at Clove, and by the time of the armistice, they found themselves stationed in Rennes. One Vietnamese soldier of the 4e Compagnie recounted, Although dead bodies lay in the heaps, the enemies kept on fighting and killing each other with grenades, shells, and poison gas. Therefore, living in the trenches was like living in a cemetery. The 21e Bataillon de Marche Indochinois was formed consisting of 1,200 Vietnamese, 241 Europeans, and 21 officers on December the 1st of 1916. From May to July of 1917, they served in the frontline trenches of the Vosges, moving in August to the area of Reims. They were returned to the Vosges to hold positions in the area of the Montigny until the end of the war. In the Macedonian front, such as at Salonika, many colonial troops were placed within battalions. There were Tunisians, Algerians, Senegalese, Madagascarians, and four Indochinese, of which two were Vietnamese. 
the premier and deuxième combat battalions. According to J. Bosch, the Comptroller General of Indochinese troops, some French soldiers in Verdun, Argonne, and Champagne abused and were hostile towards Vietnamese soldiers. Like most of the colonial forces, the Vietnamese faced racism and they would even develop their own stereotypes of the French. Vietnamese soldiers, after seeing the heavy losses for the French, ridiculed the French soldiers' inability to win battles. They had only one-tenth of the Germans' talent, and the Germans were much more superior. If heaven fights them, it would lose, too. Overall, the French military commanders had nothing but praise for their Vietnamese soldiers. In August of 1918, General Hippolyte Alphonse Pinet wrote that he was satisfied with their performance and their excellent demonstration of military codes of behavior during the battles at Chemin des Dames. On the 29th of August, 1918, General Paul Renier wrote that the Vietnamese soldiers had risen up to meet the occasion and had executed their jobs with great skill and in good spirit. He recalled, When being attacked by Austrian troops, who were far superior in artillery and in number, they pushed them back without ceding one inch of ground. Colonel Pham Van Lung was awarded the Croix du Guerre, and was promoted because he did not hesitate to attack the Germans by surprise on one of his patrol missions. De Hue Phi was one of the first Vietnamese aviators and fighter pilots. He rose up to the rank of captain. He fought in the Battle of the Somme, where he was killed. He was posthumously made a Chevalier de la Légion of Honor for being a courageous and spirited officer who gloriously fell while leading his company to assault the German trenches. Air Force Lieutenant De Hue was promoted to captain for carrying out a dangerous mission and bringing back valuable information for command headquarters. Captain Pham was rewarded with a medal for fighting off an enemy assault and for taking German prisoners. Hundreds of others received military decorations for their bravery and courage and for their sacrifices while fighting the Germans. It is estimated that over 12,000 Vietnamese perished during World War I. Before the war, many Vietnamese viewed the French as belonging to a superior race, but by the end of the war, their perception had diminished. They no longer viewed themselves as inferior to the Frenchmen, because they now had fought battles on par with the French. Fung, a soldier of the 52nd Battalion at Grasse, realized, France is not an extraordinary country, and neither were its people. In Vietnam, Frenchmen ruled the Vietnamese people, but when they returned to France, they were but laborers pulling coal wagons and scrapping mud off their shoes. Some Vietnamese serving as guards in occupied Germany saw how some of the French treated the Germans and empathized with the Germans. One soldier's report read, The French oppressed the Germans in the same way they have the animates. Many Vietnamese went into the war uneducated and poor. By the time the war ended, they had been trained in modern warfare strategy tactics, and weaponry, they became a force to be reckoned with back home and became natural leaders. Through their contacts with Europeans and their writings, many acquired current ideas of national autonomy and revolutionary ideology. What would soon emerge was a Vietnamese national movement, though it would take many years. Vietnam would overcome the yoke of French colonialism through bitter revolutionary wars. Indochina would supply around 30% of France's colonial forces alongside contingents of Senegalese, Madagascans, Moroccans, and Chinese, totaling around half a million. While the lion's share of the Indochinese were Vietnamese, Cambodians also made up a single combat battalion. On May the 1st of 1916, the 1st Battalion of Cambodian Soldiers, the 20e Bataillon de Terriers Indochinois, proudly set out for France. As they departed for France, from Saigon, the Cambodian volunteers were offered a spectacular official salute for their bravery. For many, it was the first time they even set foot on a ship, much less leave their natal provinces. They arrived in Marseille and soon set out for Fréjus for basic training. Many would serve as frontline units on the Western Front, such as at the Battle of Verdun, in the Vosges, and the mountains of Alsace, and the Chemin des Dames in Aston. Cambodians also fought in the Balkans, particularly the Macedonian battlefront. Cambodia was called on to provide 1,000 infantrymen and 2,500 workers to go to France. By April the 7th of 1916, the number of volunteers was around 1,015. To help induce conscription of Cambodians, the Cambodian royal family was used. 
With the permission of King Sisoweth Monevang, seven royal princes were inducted into the 20 e Bataillon de Tireilleuses d'Indochinois for service in France. In 1916, a revolt occurred which brought tens of thousands of peasants to Phnom Penh to petition King Sisowath for a reduction in taxes. Since 1912, large-scale road-building programs have been launched involving the mobilization of many café laborers. Another key component was the resentment for the military recruitment for France's war in Europe. At the epicenter of the revolt, over 100,000 peasants marched upon the capital. This led the resident superior François Boudin to violently crack down on protesters, causing many deaths. In a document in the National Archives of Cambodia from 1916, it outlined the benefits for soldiers. A volunteer who enlists got a bonus of $80, with $20 paid at a time of the commitment, $60 two days before their embarkment, and a daily balance of $0.24. Cents. Workers were given a $10 bonus, daily wage of $0.30, cents, with a premium bonus ranging from $0.10 to $0.30 cents for every working day. Around 2,500 Cambodian volunteers came to France as laborers, and it should be noted most Cambodian casualties occurred in armament facilities because the factory laborers did not have the same medical care as the soldiers. Generally, the Cambodians were noted for their good behavior, fierce soldierly looks, and their beautiful attitudes. They left an excellent impression and memory everywhere that they traveled. One volunteer Thierreye, named Nun from Preven province, was killed on July the 28th on the Alsace front and was awarded the Croix de Guerre, citing his courage as a brave tirailleur who stayed brave under violent bombardment, killed in the accomplishment of his duty. One veteran who returned home, Kim Ti, would later join the colonial service during the Pacific War. He then would find himself in a Japanese-sponsored cabinet and became governor of Kampo province. He was a pro-monarchist, but also a pro-independence politician. In 1919, the mayor of Phnom Penh formed a contest for the erection of a commemoration monument for those who died in France. On February the 14th of 1925, the monument was finally inaugurated. Unfortunately, this monument was torn down during the Khmer Rouge period. But the large bronze elephants that flanked either side of the monument can be found at the entrance of the National Museum today. In 1914, Siam faced a number of challenges. While it was not a colony, its sovereignty was certainly not secure. Its status was dependent in a large part on the policies of its colonial neighbors, Britain and France. It had been forced to concede territory to them only a few years earlier, such as during the Franco-Siamese War of 1893 and with the Anglo-Siamese Treaty of 1909. Alongside the loss of territory, Siam was forced to abide by unequal treaties, when World War I broke out, it began to disrupt foreign trade, such as the shipping routes between Siam and Europe. This in turn caused a sharp decline in Siam's economy. Bangkok had a sizable community of Western diplomats and businessmen. The British were dominant, but others all vied for political and economic influence over Siam's mining, timber, shipping, and infrastructure development. Siam did not view Germany as a colonial power in Southeast Asia, and therefore had a different relationship with her compared to Britain or France. German shipping lines dominated Bangkok, and German technology was widely purchased and used in Siam. When the war broke out, the Siamese government issued a royal proclamation on August the 6th of 1914 of neutrality. Siam simply had no stake in the war. However, for the next three years, this position of neutrality became quite difficult to uphold. Bangkok became a propaganda battleground for over three years. Germany, Britain, and France all continuously vied for Siam to join their own camp. More and more news spread of German actions during the war, such as the unprecedented mass killings and the use of chemical warfare. Both sides wanted the strategic alliance and commercial benefit of the only market in the Far East that was yet to be colonized, Siam. Over nine German commercial vessels sought refuge in Siam's neutral waters, anchored behind the sandbar at Pak Nam, and thus safe from enemy warships. Among the elite in Siam, attitudes were mixed. The highest military officer in Siam, and the key military advisor to the king, Prince Chakrapong Puanna, and Siam's minister to Paris, Prince Charon Sakti Krikta Kara, favored joining the Entente powers. Prince Paribatha Sukumband, Prince Mahidol Adulya Dej, and Prince Rangsig Puriya Sakdi favored joining Germany. 
In the end, King Vatia Vu made the decision to enter the war on the Entente side. Siam declared war to serve two key interests. One, to regain the full sovereignty as an equal member of the international community, and two, to dissolve the unequal treaties. There was also some economic benefit to it. By declaring war on Germany, they could now take over all the German property and companies and ships within Siam. Siam declared war on Germany and Austro-Hungary on July the 22nd of 1917, and the immediate effect was quite local. In a well-prepared and well-executed operation, all German and Austro-Hungarian nationals in Siam, around 320 people, were put under guard at daybreak. German ships anchored at Chao Preya were seized, and all German-owned businesses and property and assets were confiscated. In Germany, nine Siamese students were imprisoned at Tsele Castle. Siam decided to send the Siamese Expeditionary Force to Europe, a force consisting of 414 aviation pilots and aircraft mechanics alongside 870 automobile drivers, mechanics, and medical staff assembled. Major General Priya Biya Yarindi had overall command of the expeditionary force, while the Army Air Corps was commanded by Major Lang Tayard Pichard. The Army Combat Vehicle Corps was commanded by Captain Lang Ramarit de Yang, and the Medical Platoon was commanded by Sub Lieutenant Chump Yitmita. They sailed for Marseille, arriving on July the 30th of 1918, but unfortunately for them, tens of thousands of U.S. forces were arriving daily, diminishing their attention. The Siamese Aviation Corps began training at camps in Istres, Le Crotois, La Chapelle Laran, Biscayras, and Piax, as the pilots were deemed incapable of withstanding high altitude in air combat. The Siamese Combat Vehicle Corps trained at Camp Lyon and by October 1918 began to help supply troops using French trucks around Chalon in Champagne. They would be instrumental for transporting Allied troops across the Rhine River in Mainz. On August the 1st, during the Second Battle of the Marne, Major General Feuillet served as an observer. Siamese medical and motor transport detachments were sent to the front and took part in the 1918 Champagne and Meuse-Argonne offensives. By the time of the armistice on November the 11th of 1918, the Siamese airmen had not completed their training yet, but the Siamese ground forces had distinguished themselves under fire and were awarded the Croix de Guerre and the Order of Rama decorations. The ground forces participated in the occupation of Neustadt an der Had in the Rhinelands and took part in the 1919 Paris Victory Parade. Siam would lose 19 men in World War I, Two died before the departure for France, and the remainder from accidents and Spanish flu. Siam participated in the Versailles Peace Conference and became a founding member of the League of Nations. Siam managed to thwart colonialism as the great powers abandoned their extraterritorial interests in Siam. The last surviving member of the Siamese Expeditionary Corps, Yud Sagagrion, died on October the 9th of 2003 at the age of 106. 